Let me step back a minute from derivatives of value functions, talk a little bit more about the intuition of multi-factor models. Uh, and, and I want to try to get you to believe them. <laughs> So uh, let's turn this, uh, th let's, let's look at the portfolio logic behind how multi-factor models might work. Let's take outside income or un the possibility of unemployment as an example. Consider two assets, assets A and B. And assets A and B have the same mean, the same standard deviation, the same beta on the market portfolio. So they must yield the same expected return, right? And to you, they're the same asset. You might as well just split your portfolio between assets A and B. They look exactly the same. Now, let's add that in a recession, you're likely to lose your job. And let's also add that in times like that, times when unemployment spikes, uh, stock A goes up and stock B goes down. In thinking about the time series regression, we had the returns equals alphas plus beta on the market portfolio plus an error term. What I'm specifying here is that given the behavior of the market, they're the same in this regard. But in a recession, uh, A will have a positive residual and B will have a negative residual. Their risks come at different times. Well, what would you do knowing this circumstance? You want to buy stock A, right? These stocks are no longer the same to you. The stock that goes up in the same times when you tend to be facing job loss, that's a good stock to own. Well, no, nothing better to cushion the, the, the uh, bad feeling of, of unemployment by getting a big check in your, in your mailbox. Conversely, stock B, get rid of stock B. Here is a stock that if you own it, when you lose your job, you also lose all your money in your stock portfolio. That's a terrible stock to own. So what's going to happen, however, if everybody does this? If there's a lot of investors in your boat, they'll all try to buy stock A. That drives up the price of stock A and drives down the expected return of stock A. Similarly, everybody trying to get rid of stock B, well, it's a hot potato. We can't get rid of it. All we do is we drive down the price and drive up the expected returns. So in equilibrium, remember, we're thinking about a market in equilibrium. In equilibrium, what happens? In equilibrium, it's no longer true that the expected returns just depend on the market betas. This tendency to provide insurance against job loss or to exacerbate the pain of job loss shows up. Expected returns will depend on their betas with the market portfolio, but will also depend on their tendency to go up and down when there's a lot of unemployment. The thing that was alpha before, these would show up as alphas. And if you only use the cap M, these would look like alphas. But what were alphas before now will show up as betas with respect to another factor. This is how multi-factor models develop. We, we find paradoxes with respect to the cap M, and then we often discover that no, those paradoxes, those alphas can be explained as betas with respect to some other factor. Looked at in terms of the time series regressions, what happened? Well, now if we run a regression beta on the market and beta on the unemployment rate, for example, uh, these two assets will have different beta on the unemployment rate. One goes up, one goes down. So what was just a, a residual, uh, what was alpha plus residual is now beta plus a, a new residual. Uh, some of this residual is soaked up in their tendency to move the, with the unemployment rate. Intuitively, um, where do state variables come in? Well, this is about current unemployment, but, but news of future job loss is just as bad. If you're an investor, if you can identify stocks that reliably tend to go up in the states of nature when you're reliably to get news that your job is going to be bad in the future, then you want those stocks. If I could find stocks that would go up reliably on news that there's no more demand for tenured finance professors, I would want to buy stocks like that. The news of the future and current events are both things that we want to hedge against and will therefore try to drive up or drive down stock prices. Another point from this example, however, is it must be an aggregate hedging demand in order to affect prices. In fact, there's not that many tenured finance professors. So if I try to buy, if I can find stock like that and buy stocks like that, and even if my 20 buddies do the same things, we're not going to affect prices that much. So the kinds of events, that we're always back to aggregate events, the kinds of events where everybody's trying to buy or lots and lots of people are trying to buy, those are the kinds of events, the kinds of hedges, the kinds of state variables that will affect excess returns. And that's why they have to be aggregate hedge demands in order to qualify as factors and to move prices around.